Hello and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, and you're joining us in silly season for our first special, this time on UK versus US politics. And I believe, Rob, we're going to be discussing you know, differences and, and similarities between both UK and US Parliament and the Constitution and things like that. Is that what, we're, is that what you think we're doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Essentially, the idea is um, I know a couple of our listeners want to know more about UK politics um, if they live in the US and vice versa, really. So I'm hoping that I can give a good overview of both systems and compare them and give case studies that will be sort of like comparable between the two. Um, so you can compare that and then like apply that to your own system and understand why that's different. So fingers crossed it'll work. We'll see how it goes. Um, it could go quite long. Uh, let's see how far we go. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so shall we first talk about constitutions? Because I think, I mean, and as a British viewer watching the news uh, coming out of the States, you see the constitution mentioned a lot and it's clearly an important document. I mean, I know what a constitution is from from being in societies at university and stuff. It's like a, a legally binding document that you run your organization through. But obviously with a country, it's it, it's not all the laws, is it? I mean, I suppose that's probably the starting point. It's a it's a it's a base on which the laws are founded. Yeah, it's it's so like the most like you said, the most iconic constitution is the American one. And it's kind of like a, a rule book on how to run the country or at least some of the clear points of how to do that. Um, so the important thing with the American one is that it's codified, which essentially means that it's, you know, it, it's all written down in one document. All of your rules are there on how you can run your parliament uh, and or, or your government. Sorry. Um, and the next thing is that it's sovereign. Um, so in the UK, like parliament is sovereign, which means you must respect everything that parliament does. In the US, the constitution is sovereign. So that sort of means that you must respect everything that's in that written document. You must abide by it all the time. With the, Like I say all the time, um, as American listeners will know, you can change the constitution, but the process to do that is really, really hard and requires quite a lot of public opinion and effort from lawmakers to change that in comparison to the UK constitution, which we'll go in, which is like slightly different. So with with the UK constitution, I think it, it's been mentioned maybe more recently um, for a few reasons, especially around Brexit and how mm. certain things may be interpreted. But we don't really have a constitution, right? That's how mo- that's how most people see it. Like we don't have one. Um, so so what 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 is the actual state of the UK constitution in comparison to the US one, where it's all written down? Well, it, it's it's a mess in short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. So, so in the US, you have this, you have the founding fathers, you have a moment, you have a clear point in history where they broke from UK control and said, this is how we're going to run our government from now on. In the, in the UK, we never had that. We were all just sort of like tribes coming together and under the rule of, of one king. And the closest thing we got to any sort of, um, rule saying that we should take a bit more power back was the Magna Carta. Um, yeah. So that was back in 1215, and it was essentially an agreement between uh, King John and the barons underneath them. And the barons basically said, we want more power over you know, what we want to do. We don't want to listen to the king all the time. And over the past 800 years or so, we've slowly added new laws together to sort of stitch our constitution together from loads of different bits and bobs. So there's no one document where it's all written down. We just have these sort of treaties or agreements or laws throughout history, which we've used to inform our decision making going forward. Does that make does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I suppose probably the thing that people might ask about is um, so there have been a few Magna Carta was a big event um, where basically all the as you say, all these nobles got the king to king basically a a sword point and were like, you're going to sign this and it's going to be law. and then, but later on, we've also, I mean, we had a civil war and uh, things got interesting then because we had to go get a monarch to come back to reinstitute the old old parliament. Um, and, and and what you're saying is none of those things are in, inherently like written down. It's just like when each of those events happen, a certain set of rules kind of came in into, into play, which is probably one of the weird things about the UK. We have these very, very old laws um, yeah. That, that, yeah, haven't yet. I haven't necessarily been repealed or sometimes if they have been, you know, that it's kind of convention almost. Yeah. Like nobody, I mean, that civil war could have been our 
founding fathers moment. It could have been because it was the one split from royalty we had. But when they took control, they didn't write anything down, or at least they didn't form their own constitution to follow. And even if they did, it would have been scrapped when the king came back. All we've had is some moments through history where slowly the the, the king gave more power. Um, so we've got things like the Bill of Rights in 1699, um, which was when we had our uh, the Glorious Revolution, which was after uh, King James, who was a Catholic, was driven from his throne, um, basically by a parliament that was Protestant. And they invited another Protestant king over from um, Europe to say, hey, why don't you rule us? It was a very, um, it's a very British revolution <laughs> because we sort of said, um, we don't awfully like our king very much. Would you mind if you came over and took over our country? And this guy in Hanover said, oh, yes, I, you know what? I don't mind if I do. <laughs> um, and so he came over and he decided to run the show. Um, but when the new king came over, uh, Parliament basically got him to sign a document that said um, we will have regular Parliament's elections and freedom of speech within Parliament. So that was sort of like a very, that was a small power grab from the king to Parliament, but it was just one small step along the road of um, other, you know, other things we had. So like the Act of Settlement, which basically established the right of Parliament to determine the line of succession to the throne. So Parliament yeah. could say, we want that person to be king next. Um, the Act of Union in 1707, um, which basically united England and Scotland together um, and said that they can share a monarch that had, um, well, so between, until then they'd shared a monarch that had two separate parliaments that put all the power in parliament in London, take over control. Then we have like parliament acts later on in like 1911 and 1949, which kind of takes power again from uh, not only the Queen, but also the House of Lords. And it's a slow drift of power from from the king to parliament and therefore like the people for elections but it's so spread out through history and there's no one document that contains all of those documents in one we sort of grab from little bits from all of them and put them together to make our set of rules for how we govern yeah so <laughs> i think a bit of a mess probably sums it up yeah. <laughs> after all that so so we we've talked about this a bit already constitutions we have the US one and the UK one and how do they relate to to law to to what are the laws because we obviously have laws that are not in the constitution um, because we have we have laws written down right um lawyers can go and look them up so yeah how does that kind of tie into constitutions so i guess well, when i'm using the US and the UK as an example um so in the US the bill of rights for example give you gives you the main the laws of the land that must be obeyed and can't be done those 10 rules must sort of be you know you must have freedom of speech freedom of religion right to own firearms etc um and that's the basis of sort of all law in the us to an extent um in the uk you have different types of law that might not all be related from the constitution so the constitution's built on five sources so you've got statute law which is passed by Parliament. Um, so basically, Parliament tells you what you can and can't do. We've got common law, which again comes from like everywhere from the 1200s up to now. It's just what judges have ruled on that Parliament hasn't really explicitly said is good or bad. So if you go to a court of law and argue your case, the, the judge will look back at all the cases that have gone before and said, yeah, that's kind of what you know, that's what we've done in the past. That sounds sensible. This is what we'll do now. Um, so those are like the two main sources of law. Um, the where it gets tricky with the UK is that we've also got EU law, yeah. um, which was a big sort of one of the points of the referendum or one of the reasons why people wanted to leave is because when we joined um, the European Communities Act in 1972, um, that said that we would respect some of the European Euro European Union's laws above our own. Um, so if you think any time somebody says that a case has been referred to the Court of Human Rights in Europe, that's because even though the UK might say, oh, no, we think this is, we think it's fine by UK law, it may still disagree with EU law. And if the EU rules that to be go against the Human Rights Act, they would try and force the British government to change their law to be in line with EU laws. Does that make does that make sense? So that's like sort of a part of the constitution that's come in from, or we're talking about constitutions and how we're governed, then that's come in from an outside source to affect how we run things. So I think that's probably an interesting point to touch on because in the US, they have the states, 
Mm-hmm. And then they also have federal laws. So they have they have state yeah. laws and federal laws. Yeah. Is, is that how does that trying to think of like the UK is roughly the size of a state, right? Um, I know we're weird, but let's roll, roll with it. And then the the EU is bigger. So at the moment, it's kind of almost like the EU laws are like our federal laws. Is that is that a good uh, comparison to draw, or is it very different actually? Um, I think it's a good starting point to draw as a comparison, certainly, um, because. Yeah, you're right that the EU the EU law would be seen as like the constitution, the federal law, and we and the states have would have to abide by what the federal law says, essentially. Um we'll move on to like judges and stuff like that, but where states disobey federal law, the Supreme Court can sort of like rule that a state is not acting in the way that they should be and try and force them to change the laws. Um so it, yeah, it that's a fair comparison. I think the only thing which is slightly different or where the UK might sort of, a lot of people in the UK would disagree with that sort of federal states of Europe idea. Mm, yeah. With the fact that we've got more laws and they would say that they're cultural because Britain's laws outdate the EU by so long, some of them feel they should be sort of like greater than the EU's laws. If you get what I mean, that's like a, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I can see that argument. And then, and then there's also, we have the difficulty where we have devolved because the UK is a country made up of countries. Yeah. Um, so we have the devolved powers in Scotland and Wales, which are to different extents. Hmm. Um, and so, so I mean, there are different laws, right, in Scotland to 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 England. There there are some laws that are different yes. because of the devolved powers. Yeah. Um, devolved powers, are prob- they're probably more comparable to state laws because there are certain laws that only the UK can have a say over as the whole country. Um, but they let Scotland and Wales have their say over some little things. So I think, for example, um, Scotland is allowed to control like education policy and some health policy um, and a little bit of taxation. But the majority of money raised will come from the rules made in London that affect the whole country. Um, again, Scotland has no power over the army or national defence. All of those decisions are like protected powers that come from parliament. Mm. So with those devolved powers and those devolved institutions, they do run their own laws, but to a much lesser extent than what the, the federal or in our case, like parliament in London can set, you know, can do. So I suppose on that point, again, still kind of tied into this federal state kind of distinction. <laughs> um, in America, they have, uh, they have their, um, their, their parliament, which is, you know, Congress and the Senate. Yeah. Um, that votes on the main laws but also they must also have an equivalent thing at state level right and then we have we have the is it the the welsh assembly and the scottish is it scottish yeah. parliament i can never get the term the, right. the scottish parliament and the welsh assembly yeah yeah so like are, the, are those comparable to kind of similar things they have over in in the states in 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 the states in the states <laughs> um <laughs> Um, I'm not, you know what, I'm not sure. I haven't done that much research into um, the actual local government at state level. I'm aware of Congress people and senators, and I know that you have like governor, governorial races, like what Army won essentially in in California. But I'm not sure of how the individual, how the individual representatives, or how that breaks down within a state's region. That's something I'd really like to know. But yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you any more information on that. Oh, that's fair enough. Um, so, I sp- but I mean, I suppose it's probably fair to say that that state powers in the in the states are kind of a, a state government. It's definitely above like what we would consider a local council, right? It's it's definitely at that kind of yeah. Because states are just uh, so big. So yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. On, the, on the main, you would imagine that a state like California would have more power over its own decision making or what affects that state in particular than Scotland or Wales does just because it's such a huge area. Um, a lot of the time, if you take it back to the constitution, the constitution actually says very little about what rules should be had in each state beyond that they should respect the laws of the constitution, if you get what I mean. Yeah. So they're free to do, the constitution says very little about like, it doesn't say how much you should spend on education in each state. That's something that the state could decide. Uh, however, uh, the way that the federal government um, would control it in the US is they might limit funding for something. They might say, hey, do you want money for education? You can have it as long as you follow our plan for education. That That's how they keep control over the states. But in, in large part, yes, the states do have more power to do their own thing compared to the Scottish or Welsh assemblies. 
I suppose probably a good example of that is when the gay marriage over in the States was initially, it would come in in, in various states. <laughs> and so you could go and be married. Uh, I think that's what Ellen DeGeneres did. She went and got married to her wife uh, in California where, during a period when it was legal. And then, and then you have this kind of interesting domino effect where it slowly builds up, like it starts off with one or two states. Once you get over that tipping point of about half the states, then they call in the Supreme Court and they make a decision and they say, well, this should probably be federal law now. Um, and then, you know, the states who haven't yet done it tend to complain, or at least that's the impression we get over here. Um, but, then, but then once it's a federal law, everyone has to follow it. So, Yes, yeah, precisely, because th that's where the Supreme Court has so much power compared to the UK courts as well. So because the Supreme Court is ruling on... It, when when the case of equal marriage was raised in the United States, I think in Oberfell versus Hodges, um, 2015, um, it, it was done on the point that saying that you can't marry somebody of the same gender is against um, like one of the core rights. I'm trying to let me just I want to get this right. So let me just check, because uh, the point I'm trying to make is that. OK, yeah. So Oberfell versus Hodges um, challenged. Um, the right to equal marriage under the 14th Amendment, mm. um, which basically says that you should have equal treatment um, throughout. And it said that to discriminate and say that marriage was only between a man and a woman was unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court ruled that it was. And once the Supreme Court has ruled that you forcing people, sorry, that you're not allowing people to marry somebody of the same sex is unconstitutional, it becomes a federal law without any law having to pass through Congress, the Senate, the president doesn't need to sign off on it. It's not a public thing. It's just the Supreme Court makes a judgment on how the Constitution interprets. Um, compare that to how equal marriage was passed in the UK. That went through Parliament. That had to be voted on by our representatives and voted on as a law of the land that said, yes, this is equal marriage and this is how it's going to work. You're allowed to have it in so many places. I don't think you can have it in religious buildings or a certain set of religious buildings that were left out of the law, but it allowed it to, to pass. So when we're talking about the different powers of the constitution and the powers of the judiciary in each country, um, the way that equal rights and, and, and equal marriage was handled back in 2015 is, is a really good case study to see the different methods. You know, like They both reached the same conclusion, but they went through very different means and different organizations to get to that conclusion. So you mentioned there that um, the constitu the U.S. Constitution, despite being written down, can be interpreted by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that it exists and has been written down, and uh, as you say, it's sovereign, people have to follow it, uh, people yeah. can still decide what was meant. I, I mean, I I've seen discussions on both sides of this argument, um, and, and there's also amendments. So I suppose we should probably touch on all of those points. Um, yeah. But so, I mean, a, a big point that is met, raised is that when it was written in the 1600s, obviously people couldn't conceive of some of the problems we would have today. Mm -hmm. So following the letter of the law definitely has to be an interpretation, really, because those laws weren't written with I mean, a big example that comes up is the discussion around um, the Second Amendment, which is the right to bear arms. Um, well, I, I don't know the exact text, but I believe it's the right to bear arms and form an organized mil militia or as part of an organized militia. and kind of the point is no one really forms a militia they just want to have guns in their house um obviously coming from a country where we don't really allow anyone to have firearms i think we probably both fall down on one side of that argument um but though we won't get into it here um and that's kind of interesting because you know when when they said you had the right to bear arms they were probably basing that on muskets as opposed to um you know automatic weapons and stuff like that so how how does that process work we've touched on it a bit um and do we don't really have the same thing do we um Oh, thank you, person in the chat. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, yes, it, it does imply, at least on my reading of it, that you are, should be part of a well-regulated militia and not just people with guns. But I'm sure that's where lots of arguments have been over the, the years. Um, so, yeah, so the, the process there to sort of... So we've touched on two of them. So I'll, I'll start with the one where it's how you interpret the Constitution um, to sort of change to change laws or change the interpretation at a federal level, which will then have a big knock-on effect throughout the country. So you've got two things, you've got two approaches that Supreme Court judges can take. You've got judicial activism, sorry, judicial activism and judicial restraint. 
So the activism are people who say that um, they'll use their own sort of views and values and take into account sort of the social agenda and say, look, here's the constitution. I know it was written over 200, 300 years ago. How would this best apply to our society today? Um, and when a case is brought to them, um, so it has to be brought on like by the public, and then it would eventually get to the Supreme Court state, state the nine uh, Supreme Court judges make a ruling on it. Um, usually, because of the balance of the court, there's about four what we would call liberal, um, sort of like ones that would favor the Democrat side, four Republicans, and one swing that goes in between. So where you get a 5-4 decision, uh, as was the case in Oberfell versus Hodges, um, the Equal Rights, um, Equal Marriage Act, um, sorry, not an act, um, the, the Equal Marriage Ruling, um, it sort of went down those party lines to an effect. Um, mm. So they've used judicial activism there to say, we think that public opinion, and, and like you mentioned before, that, you know, so many states are doing this, this seems like the right time to, you know, make this a federal law. Uh, those judges who would act, act with judicial restraint are the ones who would look at the wording of the Constitution very closely and sort of say, no, I don't think that the writers of the Constitution wanted it to go this far. I don't think they would have wanted it to apply to marriage in this sense. When they made the 14th Amendment, I don't think which the 14th Amendment was made after the Civil War and was mostly done to secure equal rights between white and black citizens and slaves, essentially. Um, how could that have ever applied to equal marriage down the line? So you've got those two competing entities there. Um, but if you use judicial acti judicial activism, then that's how it gets changed. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. 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 Um, so we've got that way of sort of interpreting the Constitution. Then we've got um, if you actually want to change the Constitution. Uh, so what do you know about that? Do you know... How you would go about changing the constitution at all the only thing i know is that you have to make an amendment to the constitution which presumably has a voting process behind it but the mechanics yeah. of it i don't really understand yeah um so if you want to make an amendment to the constitution um it has to be um proposed um um by a two-thirds vote of each house in congress so you need to get 67 votes in the Senate and whatever the equivalent um, number is in the House of Representatives. Um, or the amendment can be proposed by a national convention called by Congress at the requests of two thirds of the states. So that gives power either to the representatives of the states or the states themselves. Hmm. Um, and then once that happens, that has to be ratified by um, three quarters of the state legislature or three quarters of states. Right. So, so when you take... So it doesn't sound that much, but when you take into sort of like partisan concerns and how often a Congress or House of Representatives is split down party lines, like even 60-40, which Obama at the height of his powers had 60 senators compared to 40 senators. That's how he was able to get like a thinner buster proof majority in the Senate to pass Obamacare. Um, it's almost impossible to make a constitutional amendment without there being cross-party support without both parties doing it without there be and for there to be a lot of support in all of the states as well so it is possible but it's just really really hard and you need everybody needs to be really really certain that they want to do it um so the amendment process is like the really hard way of changing laws the supreme court way is arguably the easier one because it comes down to the interpretation of the already existing laws that you don't have to change. And so when was the most recent one of these amendments? If they're so hard to put through, they presumably, I mean, so, so I know there's 27 of them. I've looked that much yeah. up. Um, uh, so yeah, there's 27 of them. So it, one would estimate probably one every 10 or so years. Does that work out as? Um, no, America's older than that. Maybe one every one every 15 years, roughly. Um, but yeah, so when, when was the most recent one? Because if it's so difficult, especially with partisan politics, um, especially at the moment with politics being very partisan, Oh, the, I think it's in the chat apparently it it's in the chat. Too. Oh yeah, nineteen ninety-two. Yeah. So, and I think the twenty-seventh amendment is just on something rather benign, like it prohibits any law that increases or decreases the salary of members of Congress from taking effect 
until the start of the next set of terms of office for the representative. Um, and as Chats reminded us as well, the first 10, the Bill of Rights, um, were all passed at once, right at the same stage that the Constitution was written. Right. OK. So I think I think that's probably that's an important thing I wasn't aware of because yeah. I always because the right to bear arms is an amendment. Yes. And I always took it to be like they decided this a bit later on. So it wasn't really in the original document. And, and and I appreciate that's all what all amendments are technically, but the fact that it all happened at the start, uh, I feel is well with the Bill of Rights is yeah is is interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, and of the twenty seven, um, the let me just get this this right. Um, the eighteenth amendment was prohibition, so yeah. that enforced prohibition, and then I believe the twenty first amendment uh, repealed prohibition. So two two of those amendments balance each other out essentially. Right. So 25 um, actual in in place, essentially. Yes, um, which is bizarre when you think how, which is, when you compare something like, we'll take gun control because that's the one that comes up most and will probably be like most applicable for sort of UK and US listeners. Um, when, so you, you have high school shootings in America and a lot of people say we want to have more gun control in place. They can't because the debate is essentially so polarised um, along party lines that it would be nearly impossible to get an amendment through Congress to repeal the Second Amendment. Um, compare that to the UK, where after we had um, the school shooting in Dunblane, Scotland, um, after that, within months uh, or even within weeks, Parliament had come together as a group, had put some legislation together to ban the sale of firearms or the, the gun that was used in the attack and put that on the books. And that was done within weeks um, because it wasn't an amendment. It wasn't in our constitution. It was just a law that hadn't been covered yet. And we were able to make the law to ban them. And it was as easy as that. Um, so it's no, go ahead. I was going to say there's, there's a similar thing in Australia, right? Where they had, I think it was the, at the time, the worst mass shooting in history. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. Within a few months, they'd put through a law to ban the sale of firearms. And ever since, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the number of mass shootings has surprisingly dropped, uh, unsurprisingly dropped much to a very low level um, in, in Australia because it's hard to get hold of them. Yeah, but, but that's that's not to say that just because you've got so because you've got a codified constitution like you've got in America, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Remember that it also enshrines the right to free speech. Oh yeah, which yeah. is which is something that the UK government theoretically could also pass within weeks to repeal. It just hasn't been done yet. So to have certain rights enshrined and it make it very difficult to change or to have some things like, I, I don't know what people think of Trump or what he would do, but if you've got somebody who you might think is, you know, not the most reliable leader of your country, they are very restricted by what they can do by the bounds of the constitution. It acts as a safety net. It acts as a check and a balance on everybody's power to make sure that those divine rights that were written down in the constitution those 200 years ago are, are still in place and are damn hard to change. If, if, if Britain was, ax if Britain was to vote somebody in who, well, I guess the real case study here would be Nazi Germany and Hitler, who was able to get himself into a place of power within Germany, had a lot of power to just rip that constitution up and make all his own laws. Then he just made everything he wanted legal and everything he didn't illegal without thinking about people's civil rights or having certain rights enshrined. Um, so there certainly is like you've got that benefit to the written down constitution of the USA compared to the sort of hard and fast us let's make it up and go along rules of the uk so we've mentioned i suppose we've, we've probably covered this as much as we were planning to here so we have a, have the difference between the two constitutions and how they work and we've delved into law a bit um one we, we've mentioned a lot of terms um that we're just kind of taking as read our readers have at least come across so yeah um and we talked about power so maybe now's the time to talk about the various houses of parliament in, in both countries um what is a congress for example um uh, maybe i i could give a brief overview of the uk because i'm more au fait with that and then you can correct me on anything and then you can delve into the us side of things yes um, please so as i as i understand it we have two in the uk we have the houses that the houses of parliament covers both the the commons and the lords so the house of commons are the people you vote for every 5 years normally in a general election and uh, the he the the leader of the ruling party, i.e., the party with the most votes, becomes the prime minister. 
So we don't we don't have the equivalent thing in the states where you vote for a president as well as for for seats as separate, I believe. Um, whereas over here, you're directly via a first past the post system, whichever party has the most MPs will have their leader become the prime minister. So you have to bear that in mind when you're voting for your local MP, but people are voting on both local and a national issue at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once uh, the, you know they're in power, that they pass the laws, um, the House of Commons will have readings of a law, which I know we've mentioned in previous episodes, um, and then eventually they'll have a vote on the law. And if the vote passes, it then goes up to the House of Lords. And the House of Lords gets really interesting and proper... This is the properly archaic, um, uh, <laughs> properly archaic thing we have in the UK. So I'm, I'm going to open this up just so that uh, on Wikipedia, just so that I can get the terms right here. So we have it was reformed in the early 2000s. So we have we have a mixture of hereditary peers. It used to always be hereditary peers, pretty much. So those are people who had the title lord given to them initially by the monarch and their children normally their male children by the right of primogenitor would inherit the peerage they would be called lord anyone they're married to would become lady by um definition i believe and uh that that carried on now that's been limited to 90 so there are only 90 hereditary peers in the house in in the house of lords and then the other how the other peerages are lifetime peerages so for example um a person people mo- most people have heard of andrew lloyd webber uh who famous for all those musicals like Cats and The Phantom of the Opera, is a a lifetime lord. It was given to him by a previous government. And the current government, I believe, has the entire say over who gets to go in? Yes, pretty much. I think they have to get it confirmed by the Queen, but the Queen doesn't really say no. Yeah, yeah. As is often the case, the Queen (laughs) rather stamps things. But, you know, she's never really used her power to say no and would probably lose her power if she did so. Um, So, yeah, so you have the hereditary peers, uh, you have the... Uh, the lords. Uh, so this is where the t- terminology gets great. So we have uh, the peerage is made up of the lords spiritual and the lords temporal. So the lords temporal are all the the normal everyday lords, but the lords spiritual are twenty six bishops of the Church of England, who are just also lords. Nowadays, as I say, the majority of the lords are life peers who are appointed on the advice of prime minister, and then um, the lords is an upper house. Um, they're all unelected. Is I mean they're they're chosen. The lifetime lords are chosen by parliament, as I said, but they're they're all unelected. And obviously the distribution of the chamber can be quite different to the distribution of the lower chamber. There's currently 793 lords and of that, obviously 26 are the bishops. And then you have nearly 250, 249 are conservative. We have 188 from the Labour Party. We have 186 who are described as crossbenchers. And I think you can probably give me more information on that but as i understand it the cross benchers basically are lords who have not declared an affiliation to a to a party at all so they can they're essentially swing votes mm-hmm. and then lib dems have 98 and then all the others are much smaller so there is a kind of split i don't know if it's intentionally drawn this way on wikipedia where they have the conservatives and the bishops on one side and lib dems and labor on the other but i wouldn't be surprised if that's kind of how the voting falls mm-hmm. um uh yeah, and they basically they they are allowed to send law punt laws back down to the House of Commons if they go oh this is wrong or whatever. So so there is there is a balance a check and balance going on. Um, but obviously each current government will try and load the lords in their favour by putting through as many lords as possible while they're in government. Um, and that's probably where our kind of our, the problem lies when you compare it to maybe the US system. But then the US system has its own foibles. So is that a good enough summary? Do you think? Yeah, is there I think anything that's- wrong? Yeah. No, nothing, nothing wrong. Great summary. Um, yeah, this there's... is something I've actually read up on because I just I, I went on a proper Wikipedia. Um, I started reading up on Earl Grey of all things, and then found out that Earl Grey was named after Prime Minister uh, Earl Grey. And then I got into the House of Lords, and I read basically every Wikipedia page on this at some point about a year ago. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, a lot of people will have they will have heard of the more controversial appointments to the Lords, so like Lord Vader, uh, Lord Voldemort. Um, all of these people, I'm not quite sure who gave them that status, um, but they ended up there anyway. But I suppose, I suppose the important point before we compare it to the US system is that these are unelected peers that, yes. that they have been put there through various methods, but none of the no, the public have never voted on who gets to go in there. Well, I suppose a very a very rich member of the public may be able to convince the prime minister to make them a lord or a lady, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's different. 
So how does that compare to the US? My assumption is, um, mm -hmm. my assumption is, and I've written this down in the notes, is Congress equivalent to Commons and Senate equivalent to Lords, or is that not how it works? Not quite. So Congress is the equivalent to the Houses of Parliament. Right. Um, so Congress means the whole thing. And then yep. you have the House of Representatives, which is probably the equivalent to Parliament because it's the lower chamber. Um, and then the Senate is the Lords. Right. So we don't tend to hear the term the House of Representatives in the U in the UK that often. We tend to just hear people talk about Congress because it's the general term. The whole thing. Um, so, yeah, the, the important thing. So unlike in the UK, where we have just sort of like one elected chamber and one unelected, the House of Representatives and the Senate are both elected chambers. Um, they have different election cycles, which means that they're slightly different in their makeup um, and how they vote on things. So in so in the House of Representatives, there's 435 members, and essentially they represent the the population of the states. So each state will have a certain amount of representatives assigned to it, and that's based on how many people are in there. So for example, California will have way more than Alaska. Is that entirely proportional, or is that is it roughly proportional? It's roughly propor as proportional as you can get it, essentially. Um, a, a bit like our own system in the UK, where we have constituencies, and some of those constituencies will have more people than others. And um, it's probably a little different between the states, um, but as proportional it can be. Um, the members of the House are elected every two years, which makes them sort of very susceptible to public opinion. So if you want to know how the public feels about the two parties, the House of Representatives is where you would look. That's the one that changes the most often. Um, uh, are you aware of like midterm elections and the midterms that are coming up this year? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that those are coming up this year. And that's because it happens to just fall halfway through a presidential term, right? And presidential terms are fixed. So barring any... Oh, no, I mean, even if a president dies, right, they would just become... The, they would become the, the vice president would become president. So the term would still be fixed. It's not like with us where the parliament picks when the election is going to be as long as it's within within the five-year term yeah yeah um so they have like fixed elections every two years um senators um so you've got then you've got the senate um which is composed of a hundred members and that's two members per state so whereas the house of representatives is meant to like represent the population's opinion the senate kind of represents each state's opinion because Alaska will have the same amount of senators as California. Um, and they are elected, well, they st they have a six-year term, but a third of them are elected every two years on a rolling basis. So in the midterms, a third of the senators will um, have their seats up for grabs, which means that the Senate, the Senate's seen as the upper house because they're there for longer. They're meant to, because they stick around for six years and can maybe outlast, at least go through one president's term and a little bit into the other, um, they're meant to have like a longer view and they tend to, well, the idea is that they would protect state rights more because they would be, um, yeah, because they're there to represent the state, it's more valuable for them, particularly like an Alaskan senator, that they really keep their seat and represent their state. I was going to say, so the, the reason the midterms are important is because presumably when, when you have a load being voted in at the same time as a president, that that swell of public opinion that elects president is probably indicative of what will also pick um yeah it's probably also indicative of how the votes will go in in congress right and then the idea is that after two years the next vote is kind of testing the water really how how, how are things going yeah it, it, it's a check on the us is all set up around checks and balances and making sure nobody has too much power um the midterm election is sort of a a, a check on that power so because you've got these two separate chambers what usually happens in midterms is that the party of the president will lose at least one of these mm. chambers. So because they're all voted on individually, um, I would say it's likely, I think, 538, which is usually where I go for my predictions on how elections are going to go, I think is predicted that there's about an 80% chance that the Democrats will take the House in these midterms. Right. So that will mean the Democrats will have control of the House. The Republicans may still have control of the Senate, but the Republicans are definitely going to have control of the White House with the Prime Minister, with, with, with the President there. Um, you can compare that to the UK, where the, 
pr the prime minister is always going to have control in the House of Commons because they're just the leader of the largest party in the Commons, um, which means they have way more power to like get legislation passed. In the US, it's harder if you've got this sort of divided government to make both houses agree to stuff to make sure that legislation gets gets through. Um, so yeah, th those are the type of differences between the chambers, how they're elected, um, how how laws go through, because we touched on it a bit with the UK. Um, laws tend to go through at the same time through both chambers. Um, so they go through the House and the Senate, and then they, they agree on the stage and they agree how they're going to, what the rules are for debate. Um, the House may agree on a version of a bill that it likes, and then the Senate may agree on a version of the bill they like. And then they have to come together with both bills and knock the differences out and make sure that they've got exactly the same bill, that exactly that same bill passes through both. Then it goes to the desk of the president who says, yes, I approve this bill, or he can go, no, thank you very much, veto the bill. And the veto means that bill's not going to become law unless you have two thirds in each chamber basically saying, no, we disagree with the president, this should go through. Right. Yeah. So there's still another check and balance there that the president yeah. can't just veto everything. Yes, basically. Um, but again, it's super hard to get that two thirds majority sometimes, yeah. particularly if the Senate or the House or either one of those is very partisan and voting on party lines, then it's nearly impossible to overturn that veto. So, yeah, those those are the main differences between them. Um, we've touched on it a bit already that it tends to it tends to work in, in, in the UK. It's easier to pass laws than in the Lords, because you mentioned that the Lords can bump stuff down to the Commons. The Lords can't do that with any bill that involves money. Anything about taxes, the Lords is not allowed to get involved in, because essentially in 1911, there was a Liberal government in that said, we want to start taxing the rich more. And the Lords, which was full of rich people, unsurprisingly said, no, thank you very much. Um, and the Commons came back and said, you better pass this or we'll get rid of you entirely um so a law was passed that made sure that the lords couldn't interfere with any money bills um also when the lords pushes stuff down to the house of commons they can do that a maximum of three times of rejecting it before it gets a free pass through so one of the more famous examples was uh fox hunting the fox hunting ban under tony blair he sent that to the lords three times three times they rejected it but on the third rejection the commons didn't need the approval of the lords for it to become law so so just a, a technicality point there do where, when it goes back to the lords so it comes back to the commons the commons has to like look at their comments essentially is there then another vote at that point so is it essentially you're saying the commons has voted in favor three times and so therefore we overrule the lords is that how that works uh, it doesn't have to vote each it has to vote if parliament decides to make any changes to the amendments or sometimes it votes on the amendments individually right um, but essentially parliament can look at everything the lords have said and go now nah, we don't agree with any of this we'll send we'll, we'll send it back again in the form we sent it to you reconsider your response so so yeah essentially they could just say no no we're certain this that this is what the people want we're going to put it through three times and the lords have to go fine then <laughs> which, which you know when they're not elected makes sense um I'm sure we can add to the list of deep dives for next next year's silly season that will go into uh, the ideas of Lord's reform, um, but we won't cover that anymore here. But, but, but you compare that to the House and the Senate, where both of those have to vote on like absolutely everything, and every rejection means a lot. Um, it means that the UK Parliament passes way more bills um, than the than Congress does, um, but the bills Congress usually passes are like have loads of scrutiny and a lot more consideration than anything that passes in the UK, probably, because it has to have that that support. Um, and, and Congress is a most productive when you have a united government. So, for example, the last two years, you've had a Republican House, Senate and President. That should be the perfect time to get all of your big policies through. Obama had it in 2008, 2010. That's how he was able to pass the American Health Care Act, essentially, the Affordable Care Act, sorry, um, because he was united in all three of those chambers. And when there was a backlash against that in the 2010 midterms and he lost the House, um, then that made it a lot more difficult for him to get anything else like that onto the agenda. Um, so you often see in those first two years, presidents rushing to push through their biggest policies um, before time runs out. Um, without wanting to derail the discussion too much, what is your opinion of 
Trump's ability to do that because I know I know it's been a big discussion. Like there was a whole thing about the first 100 days and stuff like this. Um, ha- has he been successful in getting through as many things as Obama did in that time, or is, has he kind of squandered that opportunity? Um, he's in short, I believe he squandered it because there's a, there's a couple of reasons why the biggest the the biggest and best example would be his failure to repeal or change the American Care Act which is what he wanted to do. One of his big promises was we were going to get rid of Obamacare. It's too expensive, blah, blah, blah. We're going to we're going to enforce new laws that get this through. The whole thing was a bit of a shambles from start to finish in terms of the state of the bill and how it went through some of the processes, some of the committees. Um, the bill that passed in the House of Representatives was going to be incredibly different to the bill that might have passed in the Senate. Um, and in the Senate, he had a very small majority. Um, I think it was 52 to 40. Eight um, when he went to vote on it, uh, and it only took some dissent from three members of the Senate, but they were three who were obviously annoyed with Trump. Trump hadn't been able to get them united behind the party. They were upset enough with Trump to kill that bill before it could go any further, and that's probably the last chance he'll have unless he regains control at the midterms. But I feel like, like I mentioned, I feel that's unlikely. Um, he's also really struggled with immigration reform. Um, you've had the Dreamers Act, which we've talked about previously, and how he's threatened um, a federal shutdown, which is essentially like you won't approve a budget or they won't get a budget through the House um, because the parties can't agree on um, how to pass immigration reform. Um, and the only reason they can't agree is because the parties are so polarised on, on the issue, there's no way that he could unite Congress um, behind that one issue and, and get the bill passed. The the one thing he's the one thing he's been successful at is um, taxes and the reform of the tax um, system in the United States because that's a good old fashioned Republican ideal that all Republicans agree in that you should have lower taxes. Uh, so that passed with little problem. Um, but that's about the only big congressional like legislation that's gone through that he can really hang his hat on and say, yes, I've done a good job here. Everything else controversial, like the the travel ban order and stuff like that, that's come from executive orders that Congress can't even deal with anyway. That's something that he said himself. So so I suppose that's maybe the final point here. I mean, um, we could possibly touch on how voting works, but we're going to do a special on voting later this summer. So the the president has, or seemingly has, a lot more power than the prime minister does. Is that true? Does that hold? Is that, or, or would you say in the UK that the prime minister is actually quite powerful? The the prime minister, when they have a, when the prime minister has a very strong majority in the Commons, is far more powerful than the president, in my opinion. Um, because the reason for that is when they've got a big majority, they've always got support in the House of Commons to pass what legislation they want all the time. There's the opposition can't really do much to stop it. They're not going to veto their own laws. The House of Lords is very limited in what it can do to stop it. The Queen's not going to say no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so the Prime Minister's super powerful in in that sense. The President might be faced with something where he's got one of the two houses that aren't controlled by his party um, working against him. He's got checks and balances on his power, how much he can, you know, do in the office. And um, for passing legislation, he's well, the president is super weak compared to the prime minister, where I think people think that the president has more power is on the global stage. Um, and it's because America is such a powerful country as well, that when you have the president is the head of state, he represents the United States abroad. Everything he says has an impact on, you know, what's going to um, what's going to happen around the world. Um, it appears that he, they have a lot of power when in reality, passing any legislation that can change things at home is really really difficult i suppose that's another thing another thing to touch on head of state um the prime minister isn't the head of state in the uk is she no it's it's the queen the queen yeah. is the head of state. and she is the longest serving head of state in the world because uh, you know the queen just keeps on going <laughs> yes um, i feel i feel i should stand up and start singing the national anthem but i shan't so <laughs> um, the queen being the head of state makes things a bit different as you say like the queen as we saw earlier in the year is the person who welcomes people on state visits and i suppose we've also discussed the soft power of that a little bit as well like 
there have been times where the Queen has been able to invite someone who the Prime Minister might not have wanted to invite or been able to invite easily from a political point of view, but the Queen can invite them because the Queen is not politically minded, officially speaking. So, so for example, we had Mugabe come, I believe, on a state visit, and the idea being that we could maybe show him <laughs> stuff, you know, show show him the UK and be like, oh, maybe you should do things a bit more like this, please. Less of the murder. <laughs> not quite sure how well that worked but yeah, yeah at least we gave it a shot eh? that's the idea right yeah 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 um yeah precisely um having having a head of state that's not political has its benefits um certainly in the fact that everything the queen says or or doesn't say doesn't sort of like she's she's a good figure she's a good neutral figurehead for the world and knowing that she'll always be there is a level of stability i feel i mean that might be too like noble a way to put it um, but with the president, it's far more fixed. Um, of course, the, the president can only be president for two terms, eight years. Our prime minister could be prime minister for as long as they wanted, as long as they have support. Thatcher, Blair, both nearly went over 20 years in power. Um, I think if you said to anybody that, you know, you could have 20 years of Trump, you know, that might be something that's a bit scary. Yeah. Um we we talked about executive orders earlier. Do, do, does our prime minister essentially have anything that's the same? I, so I know we don't have the equivalent thing with the signing ceremony and showing it off to all the cameras. Um, but am I right in thinking that at least via the cabinet, the prime minister can do certain things without the approval of, of the House of Commons? For example, is it not true that all treaties go through the prime minister and the cabinet? Uh, yeah, I believe they do. She's, the prime minister will have something called like prerogative powers which essentially powers that the queen used to have but they've been given to um that they've been given to the uh, given to the prime minister so they're things like um award honors sign treaties um grant legal pardon pardons um take action to maintain order in case of emergency um grant and withdraw passports um and the other one is sort of uh, declare war and authorize the use of the armed forces um which is something that Declaring war is a good power to compare between the UK and the US because it's a good example of how things have been written down, but they've been twisted. So in the UK, Theresa May would have power to go to war whenever she so chooses. But what's become convention in Parliament is that we now vote on wars. So ever since the Iraq war, it's become convention in the UK that even though the prime minister knows they have the right, they go to the people or they go to parliament to confirm military action. Uh, if you compare that to the US, in the constitution, it says that only Congress has the right to declare war. The president is the head of, is, is the commander in chief of the military forces, but Congress declares war. But the last time Congress declared war officially, I think, was World War Two. So if you think of Vietnam, Iraq, none of those were wars confirmed by Congress. All Congress, all that happened was the president authorized force in those conflicts. And then Congress confirmed the use of that force at a later date, but not in a war capacity. So that's that, that's one where the rules for the UK are one thing, but we actually do it through the parliament. And in the US, even though it should be done through Congress, actually the president in reality, has had the power to enact it. So it's weird how you can bend and twist these rules um, to your own ability. Um, and some might argue that the president being able to do that, he needs to do that where where somebody could launch a tactical nuclear strike. Is it right that the, he should go to Congress and say, we should probably have a vote before we send any missile guys? Like, it's not practical. Like, he should have the power, but that's not what's written down in the Constitution. Everybody seems to have ignored it for the time being. Mm. And I mean, it's interesting, kind of the precedent that gets set. As you say, that's essentially the precedent that's been set since World War Two, where everyone's like, okay with it. Um, <laughs> whereas we have the opposite thing where like, everyone was okay with it, okay with it. And then we went to the war in Iraq and public opinion was so against that in, well, at least afterward, maybe not at the time. Um, but afterward, public opinion was so against that, that it's essentially led to a precedent being set where we have to have a vote on it. Because at least then, when you're running for re-election, you can be like, "Well, we had a vote on it. Like, it's not my fault, is it? You know, that would would be the argument, I assume." But, but yeah. it's still just a precedent. It's not written down anywhere, despite it happening every war since the Iraq War for the UK. It's still not written down, so the next prime minister could choose to ignore that if they wanted. Um, but would probably be looked at very unfavorably by public opinion if you decided to go to war without a vote. It's, it would be political suicide, essentially. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, is there anything else you wanted to touch on? 
we've touched a bit on elections as well. Um, you know, we, we've talked about the difference between there being staggered elections in the US and the way that um, in the UK, in the way the UK, we have sort of one fixed election for both MPs and the prime minister rolled into one. Um, we just vote on the MPs and then our prime minister is um, selected from that group of MPs, whoever makes the largest party in the country is selected. We've talked about both using the first past the post system as well, um, which is a system that means that it's winner takes all. If you get 51 to 49, I'm sorry, the person with 49 gets no representation whatsoever. The person with 51 gets that person in parliament. Um, that tends to lead to another similarity between the two countries that we have mostly a two party system because um, it favours a winner takes all. Um, you've got the Republicans and the Democrats in the US and Labour and the Conservatives uh, in the UK. You've got that big split. So that's actually something I wanted to ask about because I know it's kind of generally joked about in the US that you can throw your vote away on a third party candidate, but that's not so true in the UK. While it may be true at a national level, we still have a number of Liberal Democrat MPs and we have had the coalition government in recent memory. So is is there a reason America's more partisan in that way? Is it just because they've always had essentially two big parties? Because they came they initially they had one one party, right? Which was the get rid of the UK. Um, this is our country party, essentially. Um, and then they had splits. Um, anyone who's listened to the musical Hamilton will be aware of um, at the various starting points of that. And it, again, I've gone on a proper Wikipedia deep dive about this at one point because I was confused about why, you know, ha the flip-flopping between the Democrats and the Republicans and the other parties that existed. Yeah, so, so I mean, yeah, as someone's mentioned in the chat, we had the Whigs, um, but the, like, the Conservative Party is probably the longest running single party we've had in the UK but because of political splits and things so we had Labour split off into the Lib Dems at one point and then you had New Labour come back and they won um, but since then we have had you know we have had two parties in government with the coalition so is is that any reflection of the systems or is it just like a historical accident really that we have tended to have more third party representation? Uh, so I think it, this is sort of my personal opinion here before I say that it's a sort of an established theory, but it would be it's very hard for a third party candidate to become president um, because the way the system is set up. So they get voted in through the electoral college. We could go into a little bit if you want to. Do you know much about the electoral college? Uh, I know a little. Um, so so I think I think the, the the main reason I've heard anything about it in recently and I heard about it the last time around you know it gets mentioned whenever there's an election but the main reason I suppose it's been mentioned this time is that technically Hillary Clinton had the majority of the votes but she didn't have the majority of the electoral seats so my understanding and feel free to correct me on this is that every state has a certain number of votes that go to who is president and in the past, you would have, well, I mean, still technically today, but in the past, you voted for your state representative who then went and you trusted that they would go put the votes uh, for you in the correct box. Now, te technically, that still applies. So one of those representatives can choose not to vote the way the people have told him to, but convention is that ever, they always do. Because um, uh, I know there was discussion about that when Trump came in, whether uh, one or two representatives would choose to vote against and that could ruin it for him. Um, but essentially, yeah, people vote that informs representatives as to what they should do. And then they have an amount of vote based on how big the state is. And um, that goes towards picking the president. Is that roughly correct? Yeah, that's roughly correct. Um, the only like point to add there would be that the way that they decide for all college votes each state have is the number of representatives they have from the House of Representatives and the number of senators. Right. So it's so, two plus whatever that other number is, which yes. is proportional-ish. Yeah. Um, so proportional-ish, but you're right saying like very ish, because again, it's a winner-takes-all system in each state for those votes. So you may get, I think there are two states, I can't remember the names of them, but there are two states where the Electoral College votes are split proportionally. Um, so if one person got 60%, the other got 40, they'd get 60% of the Electoral College votes from that state, and then 40 from the other. Um, and then, <laughs> but in places like if we take Florida as the big example, as the one that won Bush the uh, election back in 2000, all of the electoral college votes in Florida went to Bush, which pushed him over just even though the popular vote was far in favour. It was, was in, sorry, not maybe not far in favour, but was in favour of Al Gore. So that winner takes all system makes it, it it's, it's hard for sort of like 
there's hardly any space for two candidates almost, or you've only got the choice of two. Having a third in there is near impossible. Um, and I think not being able to vote in a third party president makes it hard for people then to say, well, who would support that third party president's views in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, both of which are also voted through on first past the post systems, which favour those winner takes all. Um, there have been third parties in the past in the US, um, but they tend to have been very short lived or once they failed, people have abandoned them. So I think Teddy Roosevelt set up his own party um, when he wasn't selected to run again as president. And he took like a couple of states in the South, but didn't do much. Um, you've also got Ross Perot, who ran against Bill Clinton and Daddy Bush, um, Bush Sr. Um, there was at the time like they thought there might be a chance that he would take quite a few votes. And I think he took maybe over 20 percent of the popular vote or near enough that. Um, but still, it was so far behind the two parties that once he'd failed to become president, it just faded away. Um, so because you lack that. So in the US, because you lack that ability to become president and you also you would lack then the support in the uh, in the legislative chambers, it makes it really hard to vote for a third candidate and think that they will win in, in the chat it's been pointed out there is there are the green and libertarian parties um that that do exist in the state so there are longer term third party parties but it, they don't get many votes or any yeah <laughs> yeah I, I don't think they have any congress people at all like out of all the senators and out of all the representatives they don't have a single person there when you compare that to how the uk system works it's probably easier for third parties to pick up the odd constituency it's, it's far smaller than the us um but it, it's easier there it's, it's also easier in the uk because there's more distinct sort of regional national parties so take the snp for example in 2015 they won all but one seat in scotland which made them you know which put them up to 54 which i think officially at that time made them the third biggest party in parliament it's way easier in our system to vote on regional lines and then have clear power in the commons because that's where you can vote against the prime minister um so, so that's another reason and and the final reason like you said, sort of history the fact that we had the conservatives and the liberals were traditionally the two parties then labor grew up as a third choice and then labor grew in pop out grew in popularity from the liberals but the liberals have already always been there and have a historical connection have been able to fight on different lines um we've got more of a history of third party success which makes people more likely to vote for them um, and the barrier with first past the post even though it's very like, not proportional it's at least easier in the uk to pick up one or two seats in comparison to the u.s i suppose maybe the the final point then before we we uh close for the evening um is one one thing uh, when when you're trying to look across i think most people have an understanding that the republican party is a more conservative party um and the democratic party is a more liberal party and then in the UK we have so so, so that you know that, that's the thing you just have to know in America the, the, there's nothing necessarily in the names um, whereas in in the UK we have the Conservative Party who are the most conservative of the, the the core parties and then you have Labour that is the more liberal one and then you have the Liberal Democrats which actually probably fall slightly right of Labour um, despite the fact they have Liberal in their name that that's probably a, a good uh, thing to explain and also. One thing that I've seen that is quite amusing is when you're discussing politics with people from the US and you sh you share maps um, because the colours are swapped because the Democrats are blue and the Republicans are red, whereas we have Labour as red and Conservatives as blue. So things can look very different if, if that you're not expecting that. So red is blue and blue is red. Uh, just remember that. <laughs> cool. OK, I made the, I've made that note. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so is there anything else you want to say before we finish up, wrap up? No, I just think that, you know, we've touched on a lot of strengths and weaknesses of each other's systems. Um, it's important to know that, like, it's a real proof that no system's perfect. There's a lot from the US, like, personally, as someone living in the UK, I would like to feel. So I would absolutely love a written constitution um, to protect rights in our country, like, to act as that safety net to have like freedom of speech and freedom of religion enshrined in like a law that was super, super hard to change would be brilliant, I think. Um, but also I'm just a little wary of who would be our who would be our founding fathers. If we were to do it now, would you want Theresa May and Boris Johnson to be the people who Definitely not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> would be my personal opinion. <laughs> it becomes too political and the question mark about who does that is like super involved. And then 
you also look at you know the UK system. You think, oh, it's it's good that we can react quickly and pass legislation super quickly. With you know that has its benefits as well. But yeah, there's there's a lot of plus and negatives. And the, the whole point of this is to say that our system is better than your system, or or vice versa. It's just I always find it really interesting to compare how two different systems have have done it. I think the US almost you could say is born out of a UK system anyway because we were around from you know we've mentioned that the start of our constitution started in 1215 um theirs is just like a fork in the road you know around the 1700s where they went right no we're going to do this and this is how we're going to run it i find that super interesting excellent so um yeah thank you once again rob for joining me um Thanks to all our listeners who have come along and listened in the chat. Um, for people who are interested in coming along and listening to us record on Discord, there will be a link in the show notes. Um, and yeah, you can just come along and listen as we record. Um, it's interesting to see people's opinions and, and people responding to the, us in the chat. Also very helpful if we forget something, um, as has happened several times this evening. So yes, um, yeah, that's great. Um, it's uh, Yeah, as, as always, you can find us on twitter at unparl podcast you can find us on facebook at unparliamentary language you can find us at parliamentary.observer and uh you can find us on reddit at forward slash r forward slash unparliamentary and yes uh so it's a good night from me and it's a good night from him bye bye, bye. 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 rob slowly gets further away from the microphone yeah so i hope you've enjoyed our first silly season episode where we've gone into kind of a deep dive on a topic uh we will be coming back in two weeks time with our next episode which is on post-war britain foreign policy and all that kind of stuff uh from basically from post-war britain to now so that should be an interesting topic i hope we can keep that down to like an hour (laughs) so we'll see how that goes um yes that's our next next episode um so good night forward slash uh oh i always get this one wrong oh if we changed we've changed it to forward slash we always get this one wrong no no <laughs> uh, <laughs> hello and welcome to unparliamentary language where we'll be uh, nah every time i get it wrong every time <laughs> every time i try and think of too many things <laughs>